Let's talk about Ukraine. You might have heard that Russia's definitely going to invade Ukraine. And um, apparently the USA has to do something about it, despite the fact that it's a genocidal global empire that is by far the most destructive country in, in the entire world. Apparently we need the USA to intervene and save us. You know, it doesn't matter that it's, it's a literal genocidal insane empire that destroys the left globally, does war, coups, interference literally everywhere it possibly can, forces neoliberalism on all the countries of the world. We definitely need the USA to police the world here. If something bad happens, we need the USA. And I say that as a 100% definitely real leftist. By the way, all of that is a joke. Anyone who has that mentality is not a leftist. But anyway, let's continue. The most important thing regarding this is to ask the question of, is Russia going to invade Ukraine? What evidence is there for that claim? A lot of people have been taking that entirely at face value like you know they see a media headline russia going to invade ukraine they read it and it's like oh no russia's going to invade ukraine they don't, they don't connect two neurons in their brain to actually see if there's any real evidence for that so you might be um surprised to find that there's, there's actually no evidence for that everything about russia supposedly is based. invading ukraine comes from the u.s it's the u.s government saying russia's gonna invade ukraine we can't tell you why we don't have any sources for our claims, we have no evidence for this, but it's definitely going to happen. For example, a couple of days ago, the US said Russia is planning like a false flag attack in order to justify an, an invasion. What was their evidence? Well, Price did not outline what evidence the US has to support its accusation against Russia. And his terms like false flag and crisis actors popularized among civilians by fringe conspiracy theorists like radio host Alex Jones bristled some in the press corps who pressed the administration to provide evidence of his claims. And what evidence did the US government present? If you doubt the credibility of the US government, of the British government, of other governments and want to, you know, find solace in the information that the Russians are putting out, that is for you to do. So we have a wild claim here being made with no evidence by the US government. No evidence whatsoever. That alone is enough to discount this if it was any government. But it's coming from the US government, which is well known to, for making shit up. It constantly makes shit up about its geopolitical enemies with no evidence whatsoever. This is an, an excellent case of that. There's no evidence here. If you read shit like this and you're like, wow, Russia's definitely invading Ukraine. I don't know what to say to you because you just don't operate on like a normal level, right? You don't operate on, on a level where you need actual evidence to, to form your beliefs. So there's no, there's no way that I can get through to you. More evidence of this. Recent BBC article. Ukraine tensions. US sources say Russia 70% ready to invade. Okay. Let's search for evidence. The US officials did not provide Tell evidence for their assessment. Even the BBC. The US officials did not provide evidence for their assessment. Russia has assembled 70% of the, mility, the military capability needed for a full-scale invasion of Ukraine in the coming weeks, US officials say. The US officials did not provide evidence for their assessment. This is where this entire narrative is coming from. The US government making baseless claims. The Russian government has said absolutely nothing to any effect to make us think that they're going to invade Ukraine. Absolutely nothing. Not a single fucking word that should make us suspect that. It's all coming from the US government based off no evidence. What are they citing as the evidence? The only, well, this isn't their evidence, this is the BBC's evidence, they insert this. Russia is said to have more than 100,000 troops near Ukraine's borders, but denies planning to attack, okay? Russia has 100,000 troops near, Ukraine board, near Ukraine's borders. That, is that true? Probably. Now, is Russia having 100,000 troops near Ukraine's border, in Russia, by the way, they're in Russia, Russian troops in Russia, Evidence of an invasion. Well, for one, 100,000 troops is not nearly enough to take Ukraine. That's less than half of the strength of Ukraine's current military, so that's obviously nowhere near enough for an invasion. They need, like, what? Four or five times that to be safe. But this has happened many times before. Many times before. Let's do some Googling. Anyone can look this up. When you hear shit like this, you should be looking into them yourself. You shouldn't wait for a streamer like me to, to do it for you. Article from 2016. Russian troop... Build up along Ukraine border raises war fears. Did they invade? No. Article from 2018. Over 80,000 Russian troops in and around Ukraine. Did they invade? No. Article from 2020. 90,000 Russian troops near Ukraine. Did they invade? No. Another article from 2018. Did they invade? No. Russian troop build up on western border from 2017. Did they invade? No. 100,000 Russian troops 
going to NATO's borders in 2017. Did they invade? No. This has happened before, essentially every fucking year for the last six or seven years or so, okay? There's nothing special about Russia having 100,000 troops on its border of Ukraine in Russia. Nothing new about that. There's no extra reason to suspect that they're going to invade now than there was before, unless you just want to take the US government at its word. The entire narrative hinges on nothing. Anyone who's accepting this is a fucking idiot. Is it possible that Russia might, like, pull a fast one for no reason that makes any sense and invade Ukraine this time? I mean, sure. It's also possible that I wake up tomorrow and I'm like a fucking fly. Two things that I think are theoretically possible. But there's no basis for me to think that tomorrow I'm gonna wake up and be a fly. Just like there's not really much of a basis for me to think that this time's different to all the other times. The only reason for that you're thinking that is because you've been told to by the media that is sourcing all of its claims and headlines from the US and UK government and nothing more. And a hun as I said, 100,000 troops, nowhere near enough for an invasion. What other evidence is there? We got a, an article from a German tabloid. Putin's coup plan for Ukraine. Explosive details on planned Russian invasion of Ukraine. Secret services already have information about the, the cruel puppet regime that the Kremlin wants to establish in Ukraine. A foreign intelligence service has gathered details of Russian post-war plans in Ukraine. A secret report was created from the knowledge gained by the intelligence service. And then it's fucking paywalled. Incredible. Read Putin's plans with Build Plus. Pay your monthly subscription fee. Now, this is obviously a bullshit article. I read it when it, before it was um, paywalled a couple days ago, and it, there's no evidence. There's no evidence at all. Just some graphics drawn up by like the graphic design team at this shitty fucking German tabloid. No evidence presented. It's like if you don't trust else. the CIA, then who do you trust? Then none of these people have any evidence that Russia plans to invade Ukraine. At least not any more than they did the last four or five times they amassed 100,000 troops on the Ukraine border. There's no reason to suspect that this time is going to be different. If you've been buying this shit, like, like our friend here, like this fella here, war seems inevitable. Based off what exactly? Based off what exactly does war seem inevitable? Because Russia has done something that they've done four or five times before. Because the US government, providing, providing no evidence, said that Russia is definitely going to do a false flag attack with crisis actors. Is that it? Well, I honestly don't know because in this video, our friend here doesn't cite a single source. He just brings up a map of Ukraine and talks. There's nothing there. Like, he doesn't even get to the point of citing the US government because he doesn't cite anything. There's literally no reason to believe, based off the evidence, that Russia wants to invade Ukraine at least right now. All of this is just fucking essentially saber rattling because they're doing, they're beginning to do movements. The US and NATO are beginning to do movements to try and bring Ukraine closer to NATO. Uh, a media narrative of a Russian invasion is very convenient for that because it gives them like further justification, further public opinion, essentially manufactured consent to do that. You gotta be a fucking moron to think this is real, I'm sorry. Hopefully you've changed your mind now, otherwise you're still a moron. Hopefully in the future you'll be more careful about this. There's plenty of precedence of the US government outright fucking lying about these things. In the first Gulf War, one of their main justifications for intervening after Saddam's invasion of Kuwait was a story that Iraqi soldiers were throwing babies out of incubators. That was false. One of their main justifications for invading Iraq the next time was this idea that Saddam had weapons of mass destruction. That was false also. They, all, they made it up both times completely. One of their main justifications for invading Afghanistan was the idea that the Taliban were harboring Osama bin Laden wouldn't hand him over. The Taliban offered to hand Osama bin Laden over. They invaded anyway. Now we have the USA telling you, oh yeah, Russia's going to do a false flag attack. They're going to invade after a false flag attack, making a fake video with crisis actors. And Russia's they've built up 70% of their strength on the border. Soon they're going to invade. By the way, we're providing no evidence for this, but... We, we swear, take our word for it. You take their word for it, you, then you just want to believe what they have to say. And I'm sorry, but I assume if you're watching my channel, you're probably a leftist, but you're not a leftist if you believe that. You're either very stupid, or you're someone who wants to believe what they say because, you know, their geopolitical goals align with yours. It's convenient for you when they lie. So people that kind of jump the shark completely here, they, 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 they're essentially taking that Russia is going to invade Ukraine as a fact without thinking that's up for any discussion at all. It's very much up for discussion. In fact, there's no basis to believe that. And they immediately moved on to these hypotheticals like, what should we do if Russia invades Ukraine? Without asking the question, why do I think that Russia is going to invade Ukraine? If you don't trust the CIA, Ukraine? then who do you trust? Because the CIA said so? 
Well, as Hunter Avalon said, that's a good enough reason, right? So let's move on then to what if, what if the hypothetical? Well, let's talk about some context that's always being left out here. In the Bolivia coup in 2019, which I'm sure most of my viewers obviously know this was a coup, Evo Morales, the elected president, was forced to resign after protests in um, urban centers involving copious elements of the far right, and then replaced with a right-wing president who tried to do neoliberalism, blah, 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 we all know the story. Same thing happened in Ukraine in 2013, 2014. An elected president was overthrown by protest, which involved very heavy far-right elements, forced to resign, forced to flee the country. But this president was, um, he was going to sign an, an agreement, or he was like thinking about signing an agreement to bring Ukraine closer to the EU, but um, to do that, he was being asked to accept a massive IMF loan with structural adjustments. So in place of that, he started aligning Ukraine more with Russia, rather than aligning it outright with the, re with the West. That is what spurred the protest. So he was overthrown in a coup. It's a coup. He was an elected president. Doesn't matter if you think it was a good coup or not, it's still a coup. He was overthrown. He was an elected president who was overthrown by mass protests, which I'm not going to say were neo-Nazis because they had neo-Nazis in them, but not everyone was, were neo-Nazis. Some of them were just normal ass, boring liberals who are functionally right wing, but you know, you can't call them Nazis at least. Got to give them that. He was overthrown with um, diplomatic, moral, and monetary support from the USA, which has injected billions of dollars into so-called opposition movements in Ukraine for decades. If you don't believe me, I'll show you a video of um, the Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs at the time outright saying that the USA has given $5 billion to the Ukrainian opposition in the last, since 1991, openly stated. Since Ukraine's independence in 1991, the United States has supported Ukrainians as they build democratic skills and institutions, as they promote civic participation and good governance, all of which are preconditions for Ukraine to achieve its European aspirations. We've invested over $5 billion to assist Ukraine in these and other goals that will ensure a secure and prosperous and democratic Ukraine. Today, there are senior officials in the Ukrainian government in the business community, as well as in the opposition, civil society, and the religious community who believe in this democratic and European future for their country. And they've been working hard to move their country and their president in the right direction. Look, that's the most generic American imperialist rhetoric you could possibly imagine. We are funneling billions of dollars to the opposition in a country in order to force them to, to align with our geopolitical bloc. We have the business community on our side. There's not really much more to that, okay? It's clear as fucking day, they're open about it. I don't need to invent a conspiracy because they were just open about it. So the US was supporting the protesters because, you know, they, the protesters were right-wingers who were um, protesting against aligning with Russia, which the elected president was trying to do. He wasn't trying to outright align with Russia, he was just trying to sort of play both sides because the deal from the EU wasn't very good, involving um, massive neoliberal reforms and an IMF loan. So after he was overthrown and forced to resign and leave the country before his mandate was over, meaning that he was overthrown in a coup, just like Evo Morales was overthrown in a coup in Bolivia in a very similar way, he was replaced with someone who was hand-picked to replace him by the USA. There is clear evidence of this. I'm not making this up. There is obvious evidence of this printed in the mainstream media, in the fucking BBC. This is a leaked call between the US ambassador to Ukraine and the assistant secretary of state at the time, Victoria Nuland, the same woman who we just heard talking, where they had a phone conversation where they handpicked who the new, the new government of Ukraine, the new um, president of Ukraine was going to be. Sorry, he was, they, they, they handpicked the prime minister, not the president. This is, this is about the prime minister. So they're talking about like, you know, who should be the next prime minister? The assistant secretary of state here says, I think Yats, meaning um, Yatsenyuk, I think he's the guy who's got the economic experience, as in he's a neoliberal who'll do what they want, and the governing experience. And the person who wrote this interview in the BBC says like, an intriguing insight into the foreign, po foreign policy process, what's going on on all levels. Various officials attempting to marshal the Ukrainian opposition. Biden was also Tell intimately involved in this, by the way. He, this guy was selected personally by the US State Department. Here, you know, they, they, the ambassador and the US Assistant Secretary of State talk about setting up a call with the opposition to choose who would be the new PM, blah, blah, blah. 
And, um, well, guess who was cho then chosen as the new PM? The same fucking guy, Yatsenyuk. Now, what happened next? Well, one month later, IMF agrees $27 billion loan for Ukraine. The new government, handpicked by the USA, immediately realigned with the Western Bloc, with the US, and against Russia, rather than just being sort of between them, as the previous government was. The IMF immediately instituted the same sort of structural adjustments that it does everywhere. Gas prices went up 300%. The IMF um, straight up released a paper this year, last year about its progress on structural adjustments in Ukraine. You know, this is what the IMF does. They give you a loan and they say, okay, we need you to implement neoliberal reforms to completely wreck your economy for us. Because that's why they give loans. It's, we give you this money and in, in return, you neoliberalize your economy so that the US can control it better, basically. That's what this is all about. This is the neoliberal imperialist bloc who, who are trying to bring Ukraine into their sphere. And they did, they won. You can see here, they have, um, like some of the things that they um that they judge success by labor markets for example structural indicators related to minimum wages and other regulations that affect labor market flexibility essentially they want as little labor laws as possible as little worker protections as possible they want an unprotected economy with no tariffs they want the financial system to to provide good access to financial services and the soundness of the banking sector and financial markets. They want to protect the rule of law and the protection of property rights. Of course, that's all they care about. This is the IMF. They're open about this. It's not a fucking conspiracy. It's right fucking there. This is an IMF document. This is this is the, the terms by which they judge the, the success of their loans. So what happened there is the USA interfered in another country's politic. Now, whether the actual movement was um was spurred by the US, I don't think so. You know, there's, there's plenty of Nazis and, and right-wingers and neoliberals in Ukraine to go around, enough to like, you know, form a big protest movement, just as there were enough right-wingers in Bolivia to form a big protest movement, even though they technically were nowhere near being majority popular. So we have a protest movement that essentially resulted in a coup against an elected government, and that government was then replaced by a hand-picked U.S. government successor who then did everything that the U.S. and Western Bloc wanted Ukraine to do that the previous government was, try was kind of trying to um, get a better deal on or to avoid. IMF, structural reforms, forced neoliberalism, the same sort of misery that we see enforced all around the world by the U.S. and the Western Bloc. This is nothing new. It's been going on since at least the 70s. The first one was Pinochet. And um, that is what preceded the Russian invasion of Crimea. Now, the Russian invasion of Crimea, by the way, yes, it was an invasion, absolutely, but there were also, in the east of Ukraine, there are a lot of people who are sort of pro-Russian alignment. So to have a government that was sort of towing the line between them, trying to align a little bit more with Russia, be overthrown in a coup by pro-Western people, and then have, have it replaced with a straight-up puppet pro-Western government doing neoliberalism, it's not really that much of a surprise why it spurred separatist sentiment in majority Russian, Russian ethnicity, Russian-speaking areas. So Russia invaded to support that separatist movement. They also probably helped to spur it. That wouldn't have happened without the US interference. None of that would have happened without the US interference. It doesn't absolve Russia Praise for their invasion, because obviously they still invaded. But it literally wouldn't have happened without the precedence of the US literally fucking handpicking a US president, funneling money to right-wing protesters, including actual Nazis. It wouldn't have happened. It doesn't absolve Russia. Obviously, Russia could have just not invaded still. But it's, a, it's, a, it's an excellent example of how U the US meddling always makes things worse every single fucking time. If you see shit like that and you're like, the US needs to get involved to make things better. You have no ground to stand on. You're just actively ignoring the evidence to make a fucking incredibly stupid claim. So that's the background that's usually ignored here. That's how we got to the present day situation with um, Crimea being essentially annexed. Now, it is true that in Crimea, Russia, you know, being part of Russia is overwhelmingly popular, but that doesn't justify annexation, separatism or whatever, because there's a, there's a lot more to a territory seceding to a much fucking larger country than just the population. You know, there's nothing, you know, an, uh, a minority ethnicity can live in a fucking country like Ukraine. Especially in Ukraine, Russian is dominant anyway. You know, there's a difference between like self-determination of a smaller con like a, a smaller part of a country breaking off from the larger whole, and supposed self-determination of a small part of a small country self-determining to become a, a, a part of a much larger country.
that's a bit more iffy. Either way, you know, there's, there's complexities here that are very much ignored in that Eastern Ukraine is more pro-Russian, Western Ukraine is pro-Western, so it's a country that's very much divided along those lines. But anything like seen as like remotely friendly to Russia has since 2013, 2014 been completely marginalized for this like complete alignment with the West and with the US. There's no more playing both sides. There's no more like a balance between the two, the two imperial powers. It's just, and like the one who's being framed as the only like party that's in the wrong here is Russia, completely ignoring the history before this. Now, of course, none of that justifies the invasion, the annexation, especially not the um, extension of the war in Donbass. But then we get to like this narrative of Russia apparently wanting to invade more of Ukraine and take it all over. Now that doesn't really make any sense because they would obviously get fucked up doing that and they know that but there's this narrative of like oh if it happens the usa needs to intervene in what fucking world is that a, does that seem like a good idea to you in what fucking world do you live in the usa is a fucking genocidal empire a genocidal empire that controls the entire global capitalist system now i can understand a liberal being like the usa needs to intervene because to them imperialism seems normal it's like the normal like yeah, the USA is the world place and that's good. We do good things around the world. Never mind the fact that everything we do results in disaster. Because they don't see like millions of people dying to install neoliberalism as a bad thing. They see it as a good thing. So I can understand that. That's just the way they are. That's who they are. They're abominable fascists. That's normal. Then we have people like who call themselves leftists, who like identify with the US, use the collective pronoun we when talking about the US and like we need to do something here to bring Russia into line. We need to make them a compliant country. Are you a leftist or what? You think the USA, the West, needs to bring another country into line, into their line, into compliance with their standards? Are you fucking insane? What is compliance with their line, their standards? Well, um, that means like you need to install like the most extreme version of neoliberalism, neoliberalism possible. You need to take out an IMF loan. You need to open up your country to um, inflows and outflows of European capital. You know, you know, you need to privatize your national resources and sell them to us. And if you don't do that, well, we're going to try to coup you. And if we can't coup you, well, we're going to sanction you and starve your people. And if that doesn't work, well, we're going to invade you and murder millions of you as they have combined in Iraq, Afghanistan, also through their bombing of Libya, and more recently through their support of the war in Yemen, mostly carried out by Saudi troops, but with crucially important US material support and diplomatic support. You know, we can go further through history if you want as to what US intervention entails, as to what compliance with the US and to a lesser extent, the European order entails. We can look at every single coup in Latin America, uh, Argentina, Uruguay, Chile, Brazil, Paraguay, Guatemala, Bolivia, a million more countries that I'm forgetting there. Fascist coups backed by the USA because of non non-compliant governments. Forced then forced to install neoliberalism, leftists mass murdered, all with the cover of the US, the support of the US. While well, we can look at Indonesia, 500,000 plus people murdered for being leftists with the, the open diplomatic and material support of the USA. Vietnam, I mean, do I need to go on? Grenada, support of the Contras in Nicaragua. That's what you say when you want compliance. That's what you're talking about. Now, you need to be an absolute fucking maniac to think that the USA should intervene and that it intervening could possibly make anything better in any situation. You have to be a fucking insane bloodthirsty motherfucker. Not only does it actively make things worse whenever it intervenes, that's what it wants to do. It's in, that's all intentional because its goals aren't to make things better. Its goals are to pursue its own interests. You know, it doesn't want to intervene in Ukraine. It doesn't want to stop Russia out of the good of its heart. It wants to do it because the shit that it wants and needs the, the geopolitical legitimacy that having Ukraine as an ally on Russia's border gives it. It needs its resources. It needs its markets. It needs the fealty of its government. And motherfuckers like reply to that saying, oh, so America bad? Yeah, America bad. And if you agree with that, if you think America is bad, why the fuck do you think that the USA should be the one to like police the world and solve problems? What the fuck is wrong with you? What kind of leftist ideology is this that like, 
supports like the world's global hegemonic capitalist power with complete control over the global economy and the most ridiculously huge military in the world that has proven time and time again that it's a genocidal fucking fascist installing empire how the fuck do you see that and be like oh it's bad sure but it needs to police the world it needs to go in there and stop the evil russian menace how do you think that's a good idea it's like saying that adolf hitler fucking ne needs to intervene to fucking protect democracy somewhere. That is absolutely fucking absurd. You sound like a fucking moron unless you're just an indoctrinated liberal American exceptionalist who believes the propaganda. This is not how leftists should approach anything. The way that leftists should approach these sorts of things is, well, Russia is a small, not small, but you know, Russia is a minor sort of regional power. Nowhere near as strong as the US, nowhere near as strong as even China. You know, it can, it can bully its, um, the nation's on its border, but it can't really do much else. Then we have the USA on the other side of the world, a much more extensive and much more genocidal, proven through, proven through actions, imperialist power with complete control of the global financial system, the control of the world's currency, you know, the ability to essentially destroy the economy of any country in the world whenever it, whenever it pleases. You know, when you have the situation and it's like Russia between, or like Ukraine between Russia and that, the option that you have there, if you want to be a leftist, is very simple. You don't support either of them. You don't say either of them should do anything. You're not like, you don't say Russia should invade. You don't say the USA should get involved here and protect Ukraine or whatever either. You don't side with imperialism. It's fucking, so fucking simple. If you're a leftist, you should not see a genocidal, hegemonic, capitalist, imperialist power as a solution to the world's problems, to any problem in the world. You don't say, it ne we identifying yourself with that power, need to act. We need to bring this other imperialist power in line with what our imperialist power wants. That's not leftist analysis. That's liberal American exceptionalist imperialist analysis. Now, make no mistake, your support doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who you say you support or not. You don't do anything. None of us do anything. Whatever happens here is going to happen regardless of what me or anyone else says. If there's anyone who deserves, like, your moral support at least, your worthless, I support this, sort of thing that you want to say, it's Ukraine stuck between the world's most genocidal, neoliberal capitalist hegemon and an aggressive, um, irredentist regional power. You don't say that we should support either of them. Anyone with that sort of view is a fucking moron, whether they're on the Russian side or the American side. And the response to that from the US imperialists is always, oh, so you support Russia then because you don't want to do anything about it. Now that is a trap. It's the same talking point that was used for the Iraq war that's been used for every war ever. Oh, you don't support the Iraq war, so you support fucking Saddam. Saddam then. Boo, Saddam supporter. Boo, Putin supporter. You don't support US intervention in Syria. Boo, Assad supporter. It's the same shit every single fucking time. If you are a sincere, sincere about being a leftist and not just using it as like a cool label because you think it sounds cool than just calling yourself a liberal, you can't fall for this shit. It's so obvious. You can't let yourself be guilted into siding with imperialism. No imperialism. US imperialism is far worse, but no imperialism. Like for someone to call themselves like an anarchist or a socialist or a communist and be like, man, we, we gotta fucking get in there. We have to fucking get in there. We gotta get in there. We gotta send in the troops and make these fuckers compliant. That is so fucking mask off. I'm sorry, but if that's you, you're not a leftist at all. You're just a liberal imperialist. You identify yourself not with the global proletariat, but with, with the US state, with its empire, with its imperialist actions, with its control of the global financial system. That's what you're saying there. Let's watch a clip, a genocidal clip from our friend Vosh. We're finally getting to it. This is a prime example of that. Now, for context, he backtracked after this and said that he was only saying that he wants to sanction oligarchs. But if you listen to the language here, that was clearly backtracking. What he was talking about here was not just sanctioning oligarchs, which obviously would not be enough to do what he says here. Russian oligarchs, as he calls them, don't care if the US sanctions them. They're rich in Russia. They don't care. They don't need the US. Okay? Just listen to this. Actual geopolitical threats will change anything. I feel like the only thing we can do at this point is start- There's the identification with the US empire. We- Starve Russia out. We need to starve Russia out. We, the US empire, need to use our control, our complete hegemonic control over the global capitalist system that we have gained over the last 50, and 50 60 years through war, genocide, coups, interference, 
etc. to install neoliberalism around the world, we need to leverage that against this other much smaller imperial power and starve them out to impose our will upon them. This guy calls himself an anarchist. Nothing about that is socialist. Not even remotely. Not even remotely. That is American exceptionalist imperialism. The USA is a special country, so it, it should do things to other countries to bring them in line, to starve them out. You know, we have to do something. If your idea of doing something... If you don't trust the CIA, then who do you trust? Your idea of doing something can only possibly entail the fucking US empire doing something like sanctions or war. You have an irreversible case of liberal brain. You don't even, you don't, you seem to not even, not even take it as an option that maybe, maybe the genocidal empire, um, can do nothing. That would be good. Maybe the genocidal empire could just not do anything and not do genocide. No one else thinks like this. Other people don't think like this. Only fucking Americans and, and their bootlickers think like this. It's a uniquely American mentality. It's called American exceptionalism. This is a big part of it. The idea that it's specially ordained doesn't, doesn't need to abide by the standards of other countries because it's the police. Communism is based. It's the world police. That's what this is. Now let's continue. Healthier than them by metrics. I mean, uh... See, we are wealthier than by metrics. He's literally just saying that. We're, the USA is wealthier than Russia by metrics. Ergo, we need to utilize, we need to use that economic power to starve them out ally with all the countries in their uh, peripheries like he's this he's literally sounds like the most insane neocon possible ally with all the countries next to next to um a country that is that is um inconvenient for our regional ambitions bring them all into our sphere and starve them out this is someone talking like he sees geopolitics as, as a game where the goal is for the usa to beat its its enemies not a fucking leftist sanction uh you know sanction their leaders cripple their economy, wait for them to bleed out, and then- Cripple their economy, wait for them to bleed out. None of that is remotely in line with his post hoc excuse of, I was only talking about sanctioning the oligarchs. He was obviously dialing it back. When they're ready to play ball, they Jeez. can be a nice, compliant then, country. I mean then when they're ready to play ball with the standards of the neoliberal genocidal US empire, when they're ready to be a nice, compliant country, maybe we won't starve them anymore. This is fucking right-wing shit. Not even the average neocon will generally regulate their speech so much to not say it outright like this. But there's a lot of civilians that get hurt in that scenario. In no? eastern Ukraine as well, yeah. But So there's a lot of civilians who get hurt in that scenario by this starving out of Russia. He acknowledges that. It doesn't seem to bother him. If, if no, they're I mean, going to be like that. If we do the like sanctions that, on Russia, is what I'm saying, that would hurt a lot of civilians. Not as much as their missile strikes would hurt eastern Ukrainians, right? You see, he's taking as as like a, a fucking foregone conclusion that Russia is going to invade Ukraine because it's this is how liberals act. U.S. government says something; it must be true. And then he's like, "Oh, so if Russia invades Ukraine, we need to punish Russian civilians through via starvation." That's what he's saying here. He did dial it back later, as I said, but there's no way that any of this reconciles with that interpretation. He wasn't talking about sanctioning oligarchs. He was talking explicitly about starving regular people. Kyle Kilinski called him out on that, and he replied by saying, well, it certainly is better than invaded. Buddy, if you sanction Russia, I would assume that you would be sanctioning them because they invaded, right? So you're not exactly doing harm reduction by sanctioning them. Not to mention that sanctioning a country... Now, what he's calling for there is genocide. Let me show you. Here's an article by um, legal scholar George Bisharat, who goes over the, the 90s sanctions on Iraq, which were kept on Iraq even after they withdrew from Kuwait. I've gone over this before, but the way that sanctions work is, for one, they can only really work when the US does them, and especially when the US and Europe do them as a block, because the US control is in essentially complete control of the global economic system. So, you know, Russia sanctioning the US wouldn't do shit. Russia's a, a tiny economy compared to the US. They will be hurting themselves. But the US sanctioning Russia will do huge damage to Russia, especially because the US enforces its sanctions extraterritorially, like it manipulates other countries into abiding by its sanctions, and it usually has its allies on its side, like, like the other Western powers like um, the EU. So the US, especially when it has its allies on its side, is ridiculously potent with its sanctions. And the sanctions in Iraq were pretty much the worst of this. Hundreds of thousands of people were killed as a result of the inability to procure medicine and food and stuff. Now make no mistake, often sanctions say, oh, we're just, they, they will say things like, um, 
oh, but we have we have exemptions for food and medicine. That's bullshit because if you sanction the wider economy, obviously it affects that country's ability to buy food and medicine in the first place. Those things cost money. You sanction everything but food and medicine, you're still sanctioning the country's ability to buy food and medicine. The point of sanctions is to cause suffering, lower living standards, hurt human beings in order to turn them against their government. That's how they work. There's no other way in which they work. In order to establish genocide, first we need to look at the intent. Now, intent doesn't mean you, they have to say, I am doing this because I because I want to kill all Iraqis or whatever. The intent can be implied from the actions. Now, obvious sanctions are sort of self-evidently damaging, right? You can imply intent to cause starvation, for example. General economic sanctions are put on, are put on a country where people already live, like, on the brink of starvation. Because then it's extremely obvious that the party that was sanctioning them would know what those sanctions would result in. Starvation. And um, this author, for example, um, sources documents that showed that the US government officials studied from the very beginning of their sanctions on Iraq what the impact of sanctions would be. One study said, Iraq will suffer increasing shortages of, shortages of purified water because of the lack of required chemicals and desalination membranes. Incidences of disease, including epidemics, will be probable unless the population were careful to boil water. Another study focusing on disease occurrence in Baghdad concluded increased incidence of diseases will be attributable to the de degradation of normal preventive medicine, waste, di waste disposal, water pur pur purification, distribution, electricity, and decreased ability to control disease outbreaks. And then tons of reports came in from third parties on the effect that sanctions were having and would have, yet they kept them. So they knew what was going on. They knew what their sanctions were causing. Yet they still kept them going. They knew that their sanctions were murdering people, and they still kept them in. So what intent means under the Rome Statute, which was the modifications to the Genocide Convention, which are followed in, in international law, that specifically applies to this, is when in relation to a consequence, that person or entity means to cause that consequence or is aware that it will occur in the ordinary course of events. Unambiguous right there. Genocidal intent. Sanctions. At least in cases where people are sort of living on the brink, and they'll push them over that brink, and it's known beforehand, sanctions constitute genocidal intent. Completely unambiguous. Clearly applies there. And then the author goes on to note um, how um, under f four different statutes of the Genocide Convention, it only needs to meet one, the US's actions in sanctioning Iraq for more than 10 years constitute genocide. The most important one here is um, attempting to reduce the conditions of life of the population to the point where they may or may not be incompatible with life, blah, blah, blah. And this is the most obvious one. And an explanatory note in the Rome Statute clarifies that conditions of life may include deliberate deprivation of resources indispensable for survival, such as food or medical services. That's exactly what sanctions do. The author goes on to conclude that there is, in view of all of the above, a prima facie, meaning on the face of it, like initial sort of case to be made, that US officials in initiating and working tirelessly to maintain a program of comprehensive multilateral sanctions against the country of people of Iraq for nearly 12 years have committed genocide. It is true that this particular example does not have the appearance of genocide in its, paradigm in its paradigmatic popular meaning. It is genocide nonetheless under the terms of the convention. Simple. You can apply this anywhere. To Venezuela right now, to Syria, Iran, and if the US were to sanction Russia with this, with similar intent to this, with similar sorts of sanctions, to Russia. So what we have here is someone calling for genocide. Now you could say, well, but in Russia, you know, m maybe it won't result in starvation, maybe it will just heavily reduce the, the living standards of the population, maybe only some of them will starve. Doesn't matter. If we look at the Genocide Convention, there's nothing in the Genocide Convention about outcome, only intent and action. So you, you can attempt a genocide, kill zero people. You still committed the crime of genocide. Any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy. Nothing there about any of the following acts um, resulting in the effect of. Act and intent, nothing more. So calling for sanctions, as, as our friend Vorsch did there, specifically with the idea of like starving out a country, that is genocide. That is calling for genocide. Doesn't matter how much he backtracked later on saying, oh, I just want to sanction the oligarchs. That is a call for genocide. It's someone saying, man, the US empire needs to do something here. I know, let's genocide the Russian civilian population for the actions of their government. Unfucking believable Same thing is, as, I, as I went over in a recent video on my channel is, is currently going on in Venezuela. 
in Afghanistan especially, in those two countries, people are being starved by sanctions. It doesn't matter if you think, oh, the government sucks, it's mostly their fault, blah, blah, blah. If the government sucks and is doing things badly, you don't put sanctions on them to make, them make things even worse, because you're just going to hurt people even more. There's only one stand to take here. You don't side with any imperial power. Now, I don't think Russia is going to invade Ukraine because there's no fucking evidence for that whatsoever. But if they did, I would hope that Russia could defend itself from Ukraine. From I mean, that Ukraine could defend itself from Russia. Ah, Freudian slip. <laughs> Thank you for the check, Putin. You know, may maybe Ukraine could get some help from its smaller regional neighbors, but certainly not from the imperial neoliberal USA, so that the, the, you know, the USA can send troops there or whatever, or sanction Russia or whatever, and then if they win, continue to turn Ukraine into a neoliberal hellhole aligned with their Western genocidal prog project with even, with even more impunity than they already have now. If you live in the USA, your only hope should be that the US empire fucking falls and destroys itself. Not that it needs to expand its influence around the world, even against another, another imperial power. Are you fucking crazy? Do you want the USA to be able to do more Iraq wars? If you want the USA to be able to um, enforce its will more around the world, to be able to completely destroy left movements everywhere, to do more Bolivia coups, more Operation Condors, more Iraq invasions, more Afghanistan invasions, more Yemen invasions, more Libya interventions, more, you know, sanctions on Afghanistan, on Venezuela, on Syria, on Iran, on Yemen. If you want them to be able to do more of that, then by all means, support them. Support everything they do. Yes, get in there. Get in fucking Ukraine, Joe Biden. Send in the fucking troops. Start World War Three. Maybe afterwards in the rubble of the world, the USA will have gained a little bit of hegemony and be able to, to do more wars and coups and the destruction of the global left even better you know maybe they'll get some structural reforms so that you can you can compete in the in the um in the labor market or whatever as the imf likes to say but don't call yourself a fucking leftist while doing that please you're not you're just a fucking liberal imperialist at best a far-right imperialist at worst if you're in the usa you are obligated to oppose your country's imperialism unequivocally and yes this is imperialism nothing that the u.s does in the world stage is not part of its imperialist agenda if you're from Russia, your only role as a left, I mean, your principal role as a leftist is to oppose everything that your government does to other countries. Exactly the same. The only difference between those two is that the US does far more and far worse. I want to address one more thing before ending this awful stream. That like Ukraine is, isn't a Nazi's talking point. It's absolutely true. There are a lot of Nazis in Ukraine. Now, this is a, this is a consequence of um, the neoliberal turn since the 70s, which by the direction of the US from its very beginning involved a lot of liberal fascist alliances, starting in Latin America, in Argentina, um, Chile, everywhere. The very first implementations of neoliberalism were done by fascists with the overwhelming support of so-called liberal Democrats the world over because they like the, the economics that they implemented. And this resulted in a lot of fascists around the world, a lot of neo-Nazis even around the world, becoming at least okay with neoliberals, if not neoliberals themselves, like a fascist brand of neoliberalism following Pinochet. So in Tell Ukraine, you have the consequences of that, which is a coalition between neoliberals and fascists and outright fascists, and outright neo-Nazis. There's neo-Nazis in the government, though not as much as people often say, and there are neo-Nazis in the military. Again, not as much as people say, but still far too much. However, that is not some reason to, to side with Russia in them annexing Ukraine. You know, we're not exactly talking about a fucking bastion of fucking communism in Russia. We're talking about Vladimir fucking Putin, who legalized domestic violence, who says that gay people don't exist in Russia. We're talking about Vladimir Putin, who has his own Nazi problem, whose number one mercenary proxy, the Wagner Group, is a bunch of fucking Nazis themselves. They are the new Rhodesian slash South, Ameri South, South African mercenaries all over Africa, all over Syria. You have neo-Nazi mercenaries backed by the Russian state. You should definitely should not be supporting the Russians. What you should be supporting are the non-reactionary elements in Ukraine, however many there may be, in maintaining their independence, in fighting against the neo-Nazi problem that they have, and against the Russian irredentism problem that they're also dealing with. At least, theoretically, they're dealing with. I don't think that Russia is going to um, push any more claims against Ukraine in anytime soon. But, hey, you know, anything's possible, but there's no evidence for that at all, aside from the US government making zero evidence claims. The, the best scenario here is there are no sanctions on any, anyone, Okay, no sanctions on anyone, 
no military action at all. And the U.S. gets the fucking fuck out of Ukraine, but that's obviously not going to happen, unfortunately. Ukraine is practically certain to just continue to be dominated as a neoliberal puppet state, indebted to the IMF for all eternity, getting rid of all of its subsidies, all of its workers' rights, whatever little may remain, on the orders of the U.S. and the EU. You want a solution to this problem? You can't bring your neoliberal puppet state into NATO for one. That's obviously something that Russia has a big problem with. And NATO, by the way, is another fucking... It's an imperialist block. It's always been an imperialist block. It was founded as an imperialist block. So get the fuck out of here with NATO is not imperialist. Shut the fuck up. NATO is essentially a military alliance of the world's biggest imperialist block, which is the Western bloc. Obviously, it's an it's imperialist. They also say it's like a defensive alliance. Defensive against what? NATO invaded Afghanistan. Nice defense there, you fucking moron. Yeah, NATO just turned from an anti-USSR imperialist alliance into a means of um, competing for geopolitical hegemony against Russia and China. The only possible solution here, if we just look at this from like a liberal geopolitical view, is that the Western bloc stops trying to bring Ukraine into NATO and the EU. Not going to fucking happen. If it happens, you're going to have very fucking bad problems with Russia. You know, if you talk about being a pragmatist and you think that Ukraine joining NATO and the EU is a good idea, you're not a pragmatist. You're a fucking ideologue because nothing about that is pragmatic. That would be a fucking disaster. Another thing is that public opinion of Western Ukrainians especially has been completely manipulated by Western propaganda for decades now. So to be like, oh, we need to give them self-determination, just like have them fucking vote on what, on like joining the EU or whatever today. You know, when you manipulate the populace for decades, obviously they're going to give you the desired result. That's what the US and the EU have done. So there's no such thing as like a, an untainted self-determination or whatever in any of these places. Anywhere in the world, really. Read manufacturing consent. You call yourself anarchists who love Chomsky, but you never do it. The solution here is for both sides to back the fuck off. The real only solution here, like the only thing that could possibly work decently for Ukraine is to play both sides, or at least obviously Ukraine doesn't really have much leverage to so play both sides, but to like cowtail to both, to balance them both. It's the only possible way that it could has any sort of chance of maintaining its independence, at least in a liberal geopolitical framework. What Ukraine should do is have a communist revolution. It's just, this is the same thing that essentially every country in the world has to do now. Every country in the world that is not just a straight up compromised part of the US geopolitical bloc or sometimes the Russian or Chinese geopolitical bloc, there's, there's very few of those, needs to just play the US and Russia off each other to balance between them. Not just the US and Russia, US, Russia, and especially China. Russia is far less important than China in, this, in these terms. But you certainly should not be supporting any US imperialism. There's no such thing as a good US intervention. There's, there's no such thing as a non-imperialist sanctioning, a non-imperialist sending troops. You fucking crazy people. And there's certainly no such thing as a non-imperialist US empire, which controls the, the entire global financial system, the global reserve currency, essentially all global banking. Every country in the world has to bank within the US, and to a lesser extent, the UK and EU. Every country. A country that has proven time and time again that, it, that if you defy its desire to control your economy, to dictate your economic policy, in, in even the most milquetoast, like, social dem democratic way, it's going to try to coup you. It's going to try to rig your elections. If that doesn't work, it's going to try to starve you with sanctions. If that doesn't work, it's going to invade you and murder millions of people. Like, you cannot think that that country should play world police against anyone. No one. Unless you're fucking insane. None of those people who say that shit would ever be like, hmm, the US backed a coup in Bolivia? Well, China, send in the fucking troops now. China, sanction Bolivia and starve its people now. Because they're not like applying this in, a, in, in what they say, like a harm reduction utilitarian way. They're not at all. They're just partisans for US empire. It's that simple. They don't believe in this thing where you can have like a limited good intervention. They just believe in the USA doing imperialism. If you care about what's going on in the world right now, well and truly, you shouldn't be fucking clamoring over a completely bogus narrative that Russia wants to invade Ukraine based on nothing but troops amassing on the border, which has happened every year for the past like four or five years. You should be worried about US sanctions on Venezuela, which are currently starving thousands of children. You should be worried about potentially millions dying as a result of US sanctions on Afghanistan. You should be worrying about the continued war on Yemen, still being carried out with US diplomatic support and with US weapons. 500,000 plus people have died there. More will die. 
Where's your concern? It's not there because th these narratives, these far more immediate problems that the world is facing right now are inconvenient for the geopolitical power that you support, the USA. Because the USA is the one that is doing those things. So you have to fucking drum up this idea of a Russian invasion of Ukraine because you're fundamentally just compromised with the USA. You do not give a single fucking shit about human beings anywhere else in the world. It's all just a cynical geopolitical game. That's the fucking Ukraine video.